Our next presentation is sponsored by Texas A&M University Libraries and features Dr. Carla Girona. Dr. Girona is an associate professor at Georgia Tech's School of History and Sociology and holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins University. Her areas of interest include early American, Atlantic, and borderlands history, as well as digital history, public history, and museum studies. Jerona's first book, Night Journeys, The Power of Dreams in Transatlantic Quaker Culture, traced the ways in which a dissenting group interpreted their dreams to shape their world in innovative ways. Her current book manuscript, More Than Six Flags, Historical Collages and Digital Representations from the East Texas Borderlands, is an interdisciplinary study of a multi-ethnic place that draws on Spanish, French, English, and Native American source materials. She has received multiple awards, including Georgia Tech's Provost Teaching and Learning Fellow, a National Endowment for the Humanities Faculty Fellowship, and a Newberry Library Faculty Fellowship. She is presenting on Decentering Philip Nolan and Visualizing Networks with Digital Storytelling Tools. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carla Girona. Thank you, Lila, for that nice introduction. And thank you uh, to the entire GLO staff for bringing me back to Texas. It is great to be back here. Uh, COVID years has made it difficult to come here, and so I am just so happy to be here. And I'm also really happy to be here and to see what the work that the GLO is doing, because um, I'm so impressed with what I have seen for the past two days. I've learned so much. It's been, it was great to hear the student presentations yesterday. It was really amazing to hear all of, or, and see the maps that you guys have. So I, I've, been, it, I've been having a great time. And of course, today you all have been here and that's been um, uh, amazing too. So, so thank you so much. Thank you to, uh, to, to, I have a list here so I don't forget anyone. Uh, Mark, Brian, James, Carlos, Julia, and Lila, and anyone else who I may have forgotten, but those are the people I've had the closest contact with. Lila gave me a tremendous uh, tour of her maps at the table, as did other people yesterday as well. So I didn't, I didn't quite get everybody there. But anyway, thank you. Uh, let's get started. So, um, so I'm going to start with two women and two portraits and a connected story. And so if you look at these two pictures and, that I have here, you will see that there is nothing in common with them. Uh, one of them is a cross that was made by Gertrudes de los Santos, and she did not know how to write. And the other one is a miniature that was made of Elizabeth Biddle. Uh, Biddle was born in Philadelphia. Santos was born in San Antonio. And uh, they would seemingly have absolutely nothing in common with each other. They didn't even speak the same language. However, they in fact are very closely connected. And their connection is through Philip Nolan. So let me ask just for a show of hands before, some of you may have read my description, so maybe you already know if you did. But if you didn't, um, or even if before you read the description, how many of you know who Philip Nolan is? So there's about you know one third, it seems, um, more than your typical audience, because we're in Texas and we're talking about Texas history. So Philip Nolan, you, you need to know who he is, even though this presentation is not about Philip Nolan. <laughs> I am not, that's, that's exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying not to talk about Philip Nolan, but you do need to know who he is. So Philip Nolan, he was born in Ireland. He becomes a Mustanger in Texas, and uh, he, uh, does several trips into Texas. And on the last one, he was told by the Spanish government, no, you can't come. And he goes anyway with an armed group. And so uh, they decide to take him on. They uh, kill him, 
they cut off his ear, and, and uh, that's the, that's the uh, trophy and proof that he was killed. And apparently this is a thing that you do on the frontier, because I found that out yesterday that the Kemper brothers also cut off people's ears and preserved these ears to the point where the families still have them today. So. So that's uh, Philip Nolan a little bit about him. Historians, have, historians of Texas have spent a lot of time talking about him. The, the, the focus has been trying to find out, was he a filibuster? In other words, more politically motivated and maybe trying to overthrow the Spanish government? Or was he just a hapless horse trader who just ended up on the wrong side of the law? So that's not, again, what I'm going to talk about today. So what I am going to talk about today is that degree of separation, that one degree of separation that separates uh, Wilkinson from Nolan. And for today's plan, I'm first going to talk about methodology. And I call that section, Artists, Historians, Cartography, and Digital History, Aspirations and Barriers. Then I'm gonna look at digital mapping and some different mapping approaches that I have tried. And then I'm gonna come back to Santos and Biddle at the end. So let me start with, middle, with the methodology. Ultimately, what my goal is, is to create a more inclusive history of the borderlands. That's always been what I've tried to do with my research. And one way that I'm experimenting with doing this is by what I call being an artist historian. I'm not sure that's the best term, but it's the term I came up with for now. Uh, and, and what I'm trying to do is to represent the past in new ways that can maybe get at deeper understandings or shift the angle a bit so that we can maybe uh, look at it, look at things in different ways. And so um, one of the ways, one of the visual ways is the digital way. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today and particularly around the question of mapping today. So um, I, I try to reimagine the borderlands in new and creative ways. I think deeply about how we do digital mapping and then I assess how we do digital history. So how did I come to this point? Um, my path as an artist historian, or also I've called it at other points, working with pictures and words, is through a class that I teach that, that Lila mentioned, I teach a class called Introduction to Museum Studies. And in that class, the students do a studio exhibit based on historical research. I wrote about it in an article called Plan C for Curate. And the, the, the main point uh, about this that I wanna make is that this is something that students and everybody we, we're all doing this. We're constant, the, way, the way the internet works now, we're all working with pictures and words. And so when I teach these core classes, and that's what these are, these are core classes that anyone can take, my engineering students take my classes. Um, when you teach these core classes, students need to learn how to write, they need to learn how to research, they need to learn how to communicate. But the new way that we're communicating is with pictures and words. So I think it's really important that we think about how to, how to teach that and also what that can do for us as historian researchers. Like what, what are the possibilities as we move into these new methodologies and way of communicating and collecting information. So of course, Digital is not the only way to be an artist historian. It's not a new thing. I have three examples here of inspirational people. So one is Eugene Savage, who painted the amazing murals at the Hall of State. I don't know if any of you have seen them. There's lots of mistakes. Lola, he's got a lot of mistakes in, in that painting. Um, but nonetheless, uh, and he was criticized by the local artists who did know Texas history for putting the wrong costumes on people. Uh, and I've got my own criticisms of what, what he did uh, that don't get things right. But uh, nonetheless, it's just amazing work that he did. And, it, and, it is, and he works with both disciplines, right? History and art together. 
Of course, uh, Jack Jackson did one of the first graphic novels of history that I've ever heard of, uh, Los Tejanos, and I was really, really fortunate once to actually get to hear Jack Jackson speak, and I'm sure some other people in this audience have as well. Unfortunately, he uh, is no longer with us, and hopefully he's out there watching us today, maybe with Eugene Savage having a drink, enjoying this. Um, I so wish that I could see him, talk to him, talk Texas with him. Another inspirational person is Nell Painter, who had an amazing career as a, and still is, a historian of race and slavery working at Princeton. But she decided to go back to art school. And, uh, and, and after, after uh, this amazing career, and her work is just really stunning, and her experiences are really stunning, so I recommend that book. All right, let's look at maps now. Map makers have also used pictures and words to describe places. And here I'm gonna uh, call your attention to Barbara Mundy, who wrote about the Relaciones Geográficas. And here's how, she, here's how she describes what Philip II was doing when he was collecting these maps, which he collected from all over New Spain. Most important, Philip II ruled over vast areas, even continents, that were out of his reach and far from his gaze. Of course, he was able to read about them through, through the hundreds, perhaps thousands of written accounts that reached his desk. But for him, as for other educated men of his time, the written found the ideal complement in the pictorial. Knowing was predicated on seeing. And uh, Mundi also argues that all people make maps, right? This wasn't something that was unique to European uh, cartographers. And so um, when the Relaciones were sent to Spain, they show the influence of the indigenous uh, map makers in many cases that recorded them. Uh, the map, she writes, by definition arises out of a particular culture's understanding of space, which in turn is presaged on a culture's own construction of reality. When cultures both understand and encode space differently, their maps will vary as well. And our maps are pretty different from all of these historical maps that we're going to be looking at, including these story maps. Uh, Juliana Barr is, has already been cited today. I'm not going to uh, read that since we've already talked about her. But to remind you, she really asks us to reimagine how space uh, and how, how space preexisted the Spanish and how a history pre-existed the Spanish, including a history of understanding space and mapping space. And two other books about mapping on the borderland, again, I'm not gonna read them in the interest of time, are Cameron Strang and Jeffrey Allen Erbig, who works on the, the Rio Plata region. So what about digital history? Uh, what, what can digital history do? Digital historians have from the beginning been really important in doing a lot of really innovative work and Roy Rosenzweig's uh, work and center, I'm gonna mention his and highlight his work because it's really at, at the heart of what he wanted to do was to make digital history be democratic and accessible and, and, that's, and that was very important to uh, perhaps the most important founding digital historian that we have. And we have seen a great example, or three great examples of story maps that are being done here at the GLO, so I call your attention to the Depages journey that, that we looked at yesterday, uh, and also to uh, Vincent Brown's slave revolt in Jamaica. And I want to say two things. Both of those are amazing sites. They're stunning, right? But in both cases, they require something. In the case of mapping cross-cultural encounters, what you guys are using at the GLO, you guys are paying for the subscription with access to the most features uh, that you can have. And meanwhile, what Vincent Brown did was he hired people that were GIS experts so that he could get the maps to look the way he wanted them to look. And so um, 
So using GIS, it requires money and it requires knowledge of technology. I'm not gonna go into the definition here. I think probably most people already know what GIS is. But I wanna mention Karen Kemp and Ruth Mostern's concern about GIS. And what they say is that this technology was designed in a way to require scholars to change their methods to suit technology rather than making the technology work for them. And so there's a lot of barriers to technology, uh, paywalls, and like I said, those changing technologies. But there's also a promise in GIS and what uh, Jen Jack Geisking, who takes a more positive approach, calls DH or Digital Humanities GIS. And uh, Geisking says, the purpose of digital humanities is not merely the production of data visualization or archives alone, but the critical production and analysis of these materials. As such, I argue that digital humanities scholars are in a unique position to contribute to the growth and development of GIS, and in so doing, the growth of spatial thinking and beyond the humanities. So here I wanna just take a moment to think about that. We, this, is, this is what we wanna do in our classes, right? to bring that knowledge to our students and in our research to be able to do this work ourselves so that we can contribute to this new way of communicating and thinking. And yet, the barriers are tremendous. So, um, part two. Uh, does digital mapping offer a useful tool for the artist, historian, and the history teacher? And by the way, I'll, I'll, the work that I do, I do work with my students on digital maps, but I don't do borderlands work because most of my students don't speak Spanish. I'm not in Texas. Maybe if I was, it would be different, or in California. But in Georgia, most of my students don't speak Spanish. Um, so I call this section Sideways Glances and Digital Mappings. And what do I mean by sideways glances? This is a term that Laura Putnam used to describe digital history in one of the most uh, well-cited articles about digital history. And she, she uh, says that the way that we historians use digital history is very shallow. We just kind of look over, you know, we do keyword searches. And again, she's arguing that, you know, we should do more than that. But so what happens when I take a sideways glance? What happens when I do a keyword search of Philip Nolan and Map? And what you will find is that almost everybody is obsessed with one question, and that is, where did, where did Nolan go? And where is he buried? These are the things that people really, really care about. They want to pinpoint him. And yet, it is an impossible task to try to pinpoint him, either his uh, either his journey or even where he is buried. Maybe someday we'll find, maybe someday the scientists will be able to DNA locate him, but um, with, some, with some special radar techniques. But for the moment, that hasn't happened. So, um, so even the, the Texas Historical Atlas, which that first picture came from that, and it's been reproduced on, on the internet, uh, even, even when they say they can't locate it, you can see they're trying to locate it. So let me, read, let me read you what they say. The exact route taken is open to conjecture, but testimony of survivors of the expedition suggests that the filibuster's path approximated the terrain that later became US Highway 80 across Louisiana and eastern portions of Texas. The Mustangers constructed a log fort and log corrals at a site on a tributary of the Brazos River. The exact location has been disputed by local historians, but in 1936, the state of Texas placed a granite historical marker to designate the approximate site of Nolan's camp. And this is what they um, based it on. This is, we've heard about uh, Puelles' map. And Jack Jackson write, writes, uh, has an excellent article about, about this as well. Uh, and you can see, uh, oop, sorry. What did I do here? Okay, here. You can see here, Fuerte Nolan, Nolan's Fort. So I also found another thing on my sideways glances, a magic lantern from 1901 showing, 
reportedly a map of the United States in 1807 from the memory by Philip Nolan in 1817. Philip Nolan had been dead for 16 years. <laughs> so you gotta watch out what you find on the internet. But um, that actually comes from Nathan Hale's short story. He takes Nolan's life and uh, completely uh, makes up a new character uh, based on a few uh, points. Um, so he, so that's, where, that's where that came from. By the way, I had to buy that uh, Magic Lantern slide from eBay. So it should be waiting for me when I, when I get home. So given these digital barriers, the pricing, technological concerns, the internet's poor ways of producing and reproducing, how can historians and history teachers do digital history in inclusive ways? Uh, and here are some of my early attempts at re-envisioning the border borderlands, using visual maps and plotting the degrees of separation. So remember, that was my initial thing, right? I'm plotting out the different people around Philip Nolan. Uh, so again, Jack Jackson, very helpful here. He has a great art, uh, book about Philip Nolan, and I plotted out all the people and where they came from. Well, that doesn't give you a very good idea of what's happening, because all you're getting is where they're from. So I tried here in this visual portrait that I made, or visual map that I made, to select certain people and show how they were moving about by showing the different places that they went to. So you get Wilkinson from Philadelphia to Kentucky, uh, or Gertrudez de los Santos from uh, San Antonio to Nacogdoches. And now I'm gonna show you my latest experiment, which was to use a story map to try to do this. So my story map is not like the other story maps. It's not meant to be a, a, a polished piece for people to look at. I do experiment with it so that I can bring it into my classroom. And so therefore, actually, I, I don't allow myself to buy the expensive package. I try to use the free package, and what I'm learning is that they're actually getting more and more restrictive and allowing, uh, phasing out the free package altogether, so you have to pay a hundred dollars to a year to keep your uh, subscription going, and, um, and yeah, so, uh, so it's getting less and less accessible to students, so I'm gonna have to decide if I even want to continue to use this particular software for my students. So I'm gonna, I began with Gertrude de los Santos, who I just love because she's so interesting, uh, and she was charged with having secret correspondence with Nolan, along with several other people, Cook, Pierre Longville, and her husband, Antonio Leal. And so I, what I do is I take this testimony and I look at all of, all of the people in there, where they all went, and plot it out. And, I'm, and so um, I'll show you what I plotted out. And I turned it into a little bit of a story map. So it's not, it's not my research guide here, but my research guide would, have, would be impossible to show to you guys because it has so many points on it. But here's a story that I tell for you guys to kind of give you an idea. All right, now I have to do some technological wizardry that I'm probably gonna mess up, but let me try. Um, so I escape from here, and now I do this. Yes, I did it. <laughs> so, um, so in my digital paths and travels, uh, I always tell my students, you know, I'm like, my kids are digital natives. I'm not. <laughs> But, but, I, but I still feel this responsibility that I need to be doing this and learning, learning this. So anyway, uh, so here is, here's my story map. And uh, it's, is it even coming out correctly? There we go. Okay, so um, that's just from, it's from the Bear Archives or Behad Archives, if you want to speak Spanish. Um, and so where did they go? Uh, is my first question, and I say these are the proceedings against Cook, Longville, Santos, and Leal. I give a little introduction to uh, that they are in, they are being questioned by the governor, El Quezabal, 
and that he thought they had secret communications. And that's, that is the language that he uses, um, not conspiracies, which the title translation actually, Lola, you'll be interested in English says. Conspiracy and correspondence are not the same word. Um, anyway, so, uh, so, they, um, so, so um, what I do is I map out the travels according to what they did. There's San Antonio de Bejar. The first detainee, James Jesse Cook, was from Philadelphia. By 1800, he worked for Gertrudes de los Santos, though previously he had obtained trade goods in Kentucky and sold merchandise through Louisiana and Texas. I have found no record yet, but Cook may have sat in the same Quaker meeting house as Elizabeth Biddle Wilkinson. Or maybe he met her while picking up some cloth in Kentucky. That's his signature. And here are all the points he went to. And so what I did was each time he went somewhere, I used the signature from the document, from the investigation, except for number two, which was not part of that declaration. Um, so he didn't say in that first declaration that he went to Kentucky, but he did. So I used a picture for that one. And you can see here where he goes. He's going all over the place. Islas Nue Negras, Nuevo Orleans, Natchez, Rapido, Nagarroches, San Antonio de Bejar, and Rio de la Trinidad. And, uh, and you can see at the bottom there, those are all the po points being plotted. And so what you can see, kind of what you can see here is that, you know, I had to use the technology that they have, the formula they have to do this, and it's not, there's, I can't make it very, uh, very pretty. I can't make different colors on the points on the maps, which I would love to be able to do. Uh, sometimes you might not know, we talked about this yesterday, plotting a place, you might not know where it is, uh, so then I just p put it in the notes. Again, I'm not exactly sure where this is that Nolan had his horse corral. He had a bunch of them, by the way, um, on the banks of the Medina River. So I just do my best. But by plotting it there, I can, I can, um, I can note that I don't know. After chasing Mustangs with Nolan, Cook built a portero and a jacal to secure the herd, and he brought the horses to Santos at Arroyo Ondo, which we heard about today. Five minutes, okay, I think I'm good. <laughs> All right, uh, and um, then we have him detained in the Presidio. Another acquaintance of Gertrudes de los Santos was Pierre, or Pedro Jeremiah, Jeremiah's Longueville. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce, whether I should use the Spanish or French pronunciation here. Anyway, he was born in France, uh, even further away than, uh, than Cook, but not Nolan. So where did Pedro go? For Pedro's map, I did it a little differently to show you guys some of the different things you can do. So his signature on the grid shows where he went when he tr and when he traveled with Gertrudes de los Santos, which we find out in the declaration that he did, I put both of their names on the grid. And so here you can see a different kind of grid that I'm using here. And there's the Gertrudes de los Santos. Um, that's actually Leal and Santos both signing on that one. And what about Gertrudes herself? And here I made another map. And so on this map I show, um, based on her declaration, um, that she was born in San Antonio, uh, or San Antonio. Here she hires Cook to build a house in a corral. She hires others as well to tend to the herds. And if you want to know more, you have to click on it. Um, that were coming and going. And then also, you can click to get to Nagadish, where she purchased a female slave from Monsieur Chabou for 600 pesos. One half is paid for in trade goods and the other half in silver. So, um, and then brings um, her, her enslaved person to, to, uh, to Nagadoches. So, um, how do you present that? Too. It's very limited what you can do with a story maps, but you can get you can get creative to show these things. 
Um, okay, and now here's Antonio Leal, her, her husband. And again, I'll use a different, I'm using a different map to show you the limited range, but um, what you can do. Uh, so he starts out in San Antonio, he goes to Nagadoches, he goes to the Tanko, Tankawa, that's the way it was spelled on the document. Um, and with the Tankawa, uh, while he was an Indian trader, he brought deer skins, buffalo tongues, and other things of this type to New Orleans, with which he obtained an assortment of necessaries for Indians. Now, um, that's another thing that I could be mapping, right? Uh, all of the place, all of the things that are being moved to, um, in very similarly to what um, Francis did today, but you can't do that on a story maps, and not even as you would need to, you would need to make layers, as I think you guys were doing on on the story maps yesterday. All right, I'm almost finished. Avoyel, Natchez, Rapido, where. Leal purchases another male slave at auction and on credit, and also um, Natchez was, he brought another slave from Natchez. So really, I want to have a way of showing that movement as well, that other people are moving with them. And then he's imprisoned at the Presidio, uh, and um, the governor chooses not to interview the enslaved people because they didn't know anything about it and they can't speak the language anyway. All right, so this ends our tour. Uh, there's a big blank there because there was going to be a map, but um, Story Maps didn't want me to use it, said I had to, be, uh, had to pay more money <laughs> to be able to use that one. So this ends our tour of the criminal cases. By the end of the year, El Gezabal released all of these people and they continued about their way staying under Spanish authorities. Um, and uh, um, people who describe Texas during this period sometimes will describe the Spanish settlements as islands and outposts. And I think that this and other work that we've had presented today really shows that that is not the case. These are not islands. These are very, very connected people and people who move around. And so that brings me back to if I get there, yes, all right. And that brings me back to, and I'm gonna skip through this because I had this in case my other things didn't work. Um, I have some more, like I'm, I'm running out of time so I'm not gonna go th over all the observations and findings, but really just wanna point out the movement that is uh, bringing people into contact with each other. But what about Santos and Biddle, where I started? And what I want to argue, what I argue, and I think, it, I think maybe um, um, uh, Francis as well, uh, I don't know, I'll have to ask Francis if he agrees with me or not, because he kind of seemed to be going in that direction a little bit too. Um, Gertrude de los Santos, I think she was Nolan's first written sex partner. He had sex partners before that, trust me, he did. <laughs> Um, and and uh, um, I haven't looked at Francis Lintot and Natchez yet, so there might be some more documentation there. Um, but but she's, she was his sex partner, and that comes up in the trial. And uh, James Wilkinson was his stepfather. That's the way they talk about it in all the sources. James Wilkinson says it. Everyone who knows him says it. Um, Philip Nolan says it himself. So what that does actually is these two women who are so different from each other are in fact uh, women in laws of sorts. And I think then to bring it back to our first presentation, I think this again shows us maybe like Texas is um, interesting, but it is connected to other places and uh, maybe not as um, exceptional as we might think. Um, and so I also did some, some uh, images, imagery with them. And I'm not gonna talk about it, but I'll just conclude with this last portrait, last digital portrait that I made, which is one degree of separation between the two uh, women. If you have a question, please put your hand up.
and please no quizzes. <laughs> no quizzes allowed. <laughs> Uh, were you planning to map uh, John Caesar, the uh, servant that came with Philip Nolan? Do, do, you have, do you have any information about him yet? Because I just found a couple things on him, and I'm curious if you have as well. Um, I have not found uh, that about John Caesar. Um, but uh, I guess what I will say about him, though, is I think you, you're, right, you're absolutely right to point, point out how important it is that he came with um, Caesar. And uh, when you look at the Savage painting, what, what, what they show is Philip Nolan and Ellis Bean. But more likely, the person that was riding alongside him, and mostly riding alongside him, would have been um, someone um, like Caesar. So that's like a real missing picture. Um, with Antonio de Leal, I did find, and so this is again, genealogy comes into this, and so this is where we can get at some of like new questions and maybe make new kinds of, que new kinds of uh, connections with our technologies, very carefully, of course, right? But um, when you look at, when you start doing searches on the internet, when I did searches of Antonio de Leal, so you can imagine, I, I do the sideway glances first on everyone, right? And, and also dig deep. I don't just look at the first page. I look at a whole bunch of pages. And um, Antonio de Leal, uh, one, of the slave, it's one of the slave women that he brought back, um, had, a had a child with him. And so uh, his descendants today have traced back to, to that. Um, so it's really, so there's a lot uh, when we start, and you don't have to you don't have to do a digital map or digital humanities to dig deep. Um, Francis dug deep today without doing that, but um, that's one way that that can be one way to do that. And so that's um, that's what I've been always trying to do is kind of dig deep and see see things in new ways. And and taking that visual approach can help. And I'm, not, I'm sorry I was. I'm sorry I didn't give you a better answer about Caesar. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I am actually less historian, more digital archivist myself, <laughs> humanities. Um, I actually had a question about <clears throat> the students that you have doing this work in your class. Um, do you find that you have um, good buy-in from the students to do this kind of work, and what kind of uh, train like uh, technology trainings. Do you need them to go through in order to create these these maps for their projects? So I loved story maps because it is easy. You do not have to know how to code to use the story maps, and that's why I, that's why I was using it. And I, I'm not doing this this I'm not doing my work with them. Um, I'll usually do something else uh, with them, like um, maybe uh, it, I have a I have a website called. Um, uh, Southern Trails at Georgia Tech, where I show, where I put all of my student work there, um, and all the student work that they did, including the exhibits, but also some of these digital things. Always saying, you know, this is student work, you know, it's not. Um, but it's a way for them to work with primary sources, right? So I don't have to use the primary sources that I'm working on necessarily. I just have has to be something they can read because they can't read Spanish. Although I'm, I might. This semester, I might try to use some translations and actually get them to work on what I'm working on, just so we can have that dialogue. Um, but uh, um, so to answer your question, story maps is great because it's easy. So I can teach. The first time I did it, uh, I was working um, as as part of this Southern Trails thing. I got a grant, and we have a digital humanities lab, which is very helpful. Uh, they sent one of their graduate students to teach us all how to do story maps. So that's how I learned how to do it. But then after that, I could, I could teach them. But it is, it's very, it can be very frustrating to students. So you have to be careful uh, how you introduce. But see, that's, that's, that's what's so important about why we need to be doing this. Um, we, our students who are digital natives, actually don't always know a lot about how to, how to um, put together images and words into some kind of a presentation. The, um, they'll, they'll struggle, they'll, they'll make stretchy pictures or you know, have too much pixelation or maybe not even figure out what the right, 
uh, um, file images to use at all. So you really do have to be willing to talk them through that. And you can't do that unless you're also um, doing it yourself. And I, do, I, did, I did, and more and more, am teaching myself a little bit more of coding. Um, but for historians, we need to do this whether we code or not. So I don't, did I, did I answer your question? It's really funny being up here. I can't see you guys so well. <laughs> um, so I had a question about uh, a relationship with um, the geography department. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do historical mapping as well. And so I, the courses that I took really taught me um, RGS Pro. Um, and then I did some research for the online stuff. But has, has there, have you worked with the geography department as maybe like a support? for uh, student accounts with Esri, or is this specifically to allow them to learn something without a paywall? So um, that would be great for the programs that have geography departments. Uh, Georgia Tech, as it's, it, we are, we got people working on ArcGIS, but not from a humanities per perspective, not even from you know, a ge geography uh, perspective. Um, uh, there's, there's, there are a few of us that work with mappings, um, but um, yeah, there's not, there's not that, there's not that kind of uh, ability. But yeah, collaborations are from from um, my first time of teaching the Introduction to Museum Studies class. I taught it in co collaboration initially with the Paper Making Museum, so. Uh, any kinds of collaborations that we can do are wonderful um, if, we can, if we can manage them. But that, that can be hard to replicate. So the Paper Making Museum, after two years, they had to fix their floor, and so they weren't available to work with me anymore. That's when, I, that's when I figured out that I need to figure out how to teach this class on my own as a history class, rather than as just something rooted in their archival and, um, and material collections. And I don't know if I answered your question either, but yes, I welcome, I, I welcome and urge people to welcome uh, those kinds of collaborations when you can. All right. Got time for one more question? All right, thank you, Dr. Jerome. Thank you again.